Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so the plan for today is I wanted to cover three topics. So uh, we can get into LLMs and AI for Code more generally, but I thought it would be interesting to look back at some of the ideas that have been developed in the area over the last 10 years or so, and you know, starting with what were the early efforts towards incorporating AI and programming languages and software development use cases to kind of introduce what are the different components and the justifications for why we use these models and what uh, different ways they can be used. Then I'll talk a little bit about what it is that uh, we want to do with these models. I'll, I'll tell a little bit about the work that we've been doing at Google towards applying this to the software development process. Uh, and then at the end, I'll spend a little bit of time uh, on LLMs and Airflow uh, itself and have a few takeaways there. So if we look back, um, sort of a, the area of AI for code has, you know, it's unclear exactly when it started, but it certainly has picked up steam in the last, say, 10 years or so. And so if you think about, if you look back and say, what are some of the earliest works uh, in the area, there's this one paper that I know of, it's one of the earlier ones about um, learning from examples to improve code completion systems. This was, I think, from 2009. Uh, and it's interesting to go back and read this. And the basic argument that's being made at this time is just, you know, we have static analysis-based tools to help us with software development. Those define kind of the space of all possible things. If I say, you know, I have my object dot, and then my code completion system can give me all of the methods uh, that are defined on top of this. But what it misses out on is uh, what is the common usage? So, you know, there's a big difference between uh, here's this obscure method that nobody ever uses, but it shows up in the uh, suggested results. And so the earliest days were just grappling with this idea of what is the difference between what's possible to do based on the constraints of the programming language versus what actually happens when people develop software. Um, this idea got sharpened and turned into a, a term that gets used a lot, even continuing today, with this idea of you know, should we think about programming languages as formal languages, or should we think about them as something that has a component of natural languages to them? And so the kind of the overarching argument that's being made here in, you know, 2012 kind of days is we should not be thinking of source code and programming repositories as purely formal objects, but we should be thinking of them as uh, things that are created by people. People have limitations and and what they can do and what they can understand and there's a bunch of repetitiveness that comes out of that which gives it uh, the ability to use statistical models uh, effectively to model these kinds of things um, moving forward uh, you know we hear a lot about scaling today and this idea of let's make our models bigger let's make our data sets bigger uh, this was also happening in 2013 we had you know much uh, less powerful models that were being used, but still people were studying this idea of, you know, if you take uh, a million lines of code and you train a machine learning model based on it, uh, and you take the exact same model and you train it on 100 times more, uh, then you start to see qualitative improvements of uh, what the models learn. And so I think it's, it's kind of this early ideas of this idea of scaling laws, which is, um, you know, it's not that you have a small amount of data that you feed into these models and then they learn the concept of it. It's that there's, there's a real diversity of what people do and a long tail of uh, different languages and patterns and uh, project-specific styles. And there's kind of far corners of the kinds of information that is embedded in the data. And as you go orders and orders and orders of more magnitude, up in the data, you're gonna uncover sort of like more nuance and there's more available in terms of what the models are able to understand. Uh, another thing that became popular around the sort of 2014, 2015 time was the idea of taking neural networks and combining them with representations of programs that aren't just token sequences. Uh, so I think it's very appealing to think of, you know, programming languages and understanding the structure of them, there's the ASTs, there's other kinds of analysis that we can do on top of them. Uh, so there was a, a, a large set of research 
looking into this idea of, well, what if, we, what if we think about modeling trees instead of modeling sequences? This allows us to incorpor incorporate more of the hierarchical structure that we know uh, appears in programming languages, and these can be combined with neural network models, and there's a bunch of sort of like uh, different ways you can be creative with this. And at the time, it was um, pretty interesting in terms of just the amount of coherence uh, that you could produce uh, in the samples that you generate from the model. So if you compare this to the kind of sequence-based models at the time that were just modeling token sequences, you get much more coherence in terms of like usage of variables, uh, usage of you know, class structures and more complex um, programmatic relations. Another thing people were looking at around this time is the idea of not thinking about just modeling the code itself, but also thinking beyond the code. What is it that, uh, uh, what are other representations of what programs do? Uh, and one of the key points there is that uh, programs have state, and so we can think about you know, the process of mapping from an input to an output. We don't need to use machine learning for this, but it was kind of a curiosity in the field at the time, which was you know, how powerful are these neural networks if we just train them to map from, you know, there's, these are very simple programs of you know, operating on integers and having simple for loops and if statements, but can we, uh, show it examples of the behavior of programs and then ask the model to develop an understanding about the execution behavior of it. This was not wildly successful, but there was uh, interesting enough results here that were surprising at the time of, you know, actually it, it can do a little bit of this. If you just give a neural network model a sequence of tokens and you train it long enough on enough tokens, it does develop some kind of understanding about the, the program behaviors, even back then. Um, another thing we were looking at is uh, something that was popular at the time was combining different modalities of there was, uh, I can give you an image and then ask for a natural language caption that described the image. So this is moving to a different modality which is kind of like the natural language uh, which is not comments or variable names or identifiers but you know, more descriptions of intent or behaviors in terms of natural language and thinking about the relation between natural language and the program structure itself. Uh, and so there was a, a line of work saying, well, you know, let's think of all of the cool things that people are doing of given an image, generate captions, let's do this with code instead of the images. So if I give you a piece of code, can we compute some you know, neural network embedding representation of it and then correlate that with natural language descriptions? And this, we were able to get some results of, you know, given a snippet of code which didn't have any natural language associated with it, get some kind of uh, uh, representation of the natural language so that you could retrieve some information that describes. So here it's you know, a piece of code that computes the ones digit, and it was, in this case, able to retrieve that kind of thing. Very short snippets, very short natural language descriptions, but getting at this idea of, of crossing modalities there. Um, moving beyond the AST representations, uh, people had this idea of, you know, a tree structure is nice, but actually there's a lot more to a program than just the tree structure. You can think about data flow, you can think about static analysis relationships, you can think about the sequence of tokens. And uh, at the time, there were also developments of neural networks that were working on graph-structured representations. And so there was this idea of, let's represent a program as a graph, we can take the AST, we can add whatever static analyses that we think are important uh, to the graph structure. We can add the token sequence, and then we can pass it to a graph neural network, and what we get is a kind of you know, neural network representation of programs that incorporates additional knowledge that we want to put into it about what are the, the formal relations in the program. And this was, uh, people were excited at the time because it seemed like a, a way of kind of you know, combining the best of static analysis and neural network representations in order to get representations of programs. And there were certainly some good results uh, at the time. Uh, and about that same time uh, is when transformers came about. Uh, I think, I don't always know, but I, I, su I suppose most of the audience is aware of transformers. These are the models that underlie you know, all of the modern LLMs. Um, 
And the way, one way of thinking about transformers in this context, or at least kind of how we were thinking about it when it first came out, is you can think of it almost like a graph neural network, except what you have is you have an all-to-all -all connection uh, between the nodes, and then you can think of the attention as learning the relationships uh, between the different nodes in the graph. So the reason I emphasize this is just to kind of show that even though architecturally, when we think about modern LLMs, they're operating on token sequences, we think of them as, as sequence models, but underneath the hood, they have this kind of idea of being able to learn the edge structure, and they get quite good at you know, understanding things like program syntax and you know, basic uh, formal relationships between the programs. And maybe part of that is uh, coming from this architectural bias of thinking of it as you, know, you give it enough data, it has the ability to learn the attention patterns. Maybe it is able to learn uh, in a latent way some of these representations that come from more formal uh, representations. And kind of the interesting thing to say here is there was a, a whole line of work of, you know, should we use graph neural networks? Should we use transformers when we're thinking about modeling code? People developed hybrid methods, which were transformer models where you could add in a graph structure with additional relationships, and this would bias the attention patterns to, to things that you want. Uh, and empirically, uh, the transformers work better at the end of the day. Um, so this idea of, of sort of giving it enough data for most of the tasks that we looked at, we have, I can point to other benchmarking papers, uh, it's really sort of impressive what the architecture was able to do uh, in terms of learning these more structured representations or, or sort of obviating the need for these more structured representations. Um, and then maybe just to sort of get to the entry point of large language models for code, uh, there were a couple of papers, uh, including the Codex paper, and there was one from Google at the time, of using large language models for coding use cases. And this was kind of you know, the first, I would say, strong results of taking many billion parameter models of scaling up uh, transformer models on a broad range of data, so training on both code and natural language together, and then looking at what capabilities emerge from that. And so the earliest wins were on these kind of like simple natural language descriptions plus some input-output examples to an implementation, kind of like a program synthesis style problem and also in code completion use cases, which I think most people are familiar with today. Um, okay, so that kind of is the whirlwind of, of ideas of modeling and, and sort of uh, motivations that have gone into this. I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what is it that we want to do with these models? How do we think of it? There's um, a bunch of you know, common use cases around uh, you know, code completion and whatnot. Uh, I'll share kind of how we've been thinking about it uh, recently. Um, and I think for me, one of the things that, that's sort of interesting in thinking about how we want to be applying these models or how to make them useful is really thinking about not necessarily just modeling the code itself, but modeling the process of software development. Thinking of this as like a a temporal sequence of activities where you write some code, you interact with some tools, you edit some code, and you iterate on that. And so thinking about um, building models of, uh, that are useful for assisting with software development by thinking about the process of software development itself. Um, so one of the early things we looked at at this line was looking at the, the temporal dynamics of edits. Uh, so we have a, a paper from a while back that said, what if we think about taking fine-grained snapshots of code as it evolves, as people write it, and you look at the changes that are being made, you can start to see almost kind of a, you know, a temporal dynamics of what's happening as people are making changes. And you can you know, disambiguate some cases where if you were just looking at the code itself and it's in some intermediate broken state, using the history might give you some information about uh, what the developers in the process of doing and therefore what it is that they're gonna try to do next. Um, another thing that we looked at that uh, is quite valuable is looking at the interactions of um, developers with tools. So in this case, the compiler. What we did is we found, we collected a data set of 
Here are examples of a broken state of code and the error messages that came up when a developer tried to compile them and then grab the next state in the sequence of edits that successfully compiled. And from there, you can get a, a data set of edits. And then um, you know, this helps you with understanding when you encounter errors, how do you fix them? And this is a, a common and useful uh, use case for these models. Um, I think I missed this part. So the learning task itself then is once you have the broken state of code, uh, you can either learn to predict the error messages to try to get a, an understanding of whether code is correct or not, uh, or you can do a repair task where you have the error message and the broken code and try to predict a, a fix. Um, another thing that we've looked at, there's a recent paper on this, and there's a, a tool deployed inside of Google that does this, is learning from code review interactions. So if you have uh, a pull request or a state of a code change that a developer has sent for review, uh, then we have lots of examples of developers leaving comments and then the author making a change in response. And you can use this then to learn a model from when a developer, when there's a, a comment on the code that describes some request or some change that's needed, can we automatically uh, predict what are the changes that need to be made in order to address uh, this model? Okay, so the, the sort of the commonality in all of these things is kind of this general idea of thinking about the software development process, all of these different steps of the developer is making code changes, uh, you know, they're interacting with the compiler, they're sending it for review, they're making more changes. This, this sort of like dynamic process of interaction with different tools and then modeling all of the different, you know, error fixing behaviors, the temporal dynamics of the editing and whatnot. Uh, we have a blog post from early last year that kind of describes a bit of what we were doing uh, in this line of work. Okay, so just in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to um, turn to LLMs and Airflow. I should say I am not an Airflow expert, uh, so treat me as a you know, newcomer to the area and saying what happens if I start playing around with LLMs in this space. Uh, so I just pulled up uh, gemini.google.com and I typed in a few queries. You can tell me whether these things are, are interesting or not, but I think the, the thing I want to emphasize is you know, this idea, this is, it's, it's not something where the models were specifically trained to get good at airflow things. Uh, but if you think back to what we were saying earlier of you know, what we're interested in modeling is the source code itself, but also the natural language around it and um, you know, kind of thinking about this generally now as we kind of want to be able to answer any question that somebody has uh, about a particular subject area. So come in and just say, what is Apache Airflow? Um, it gives a description here. This was useful for me. Somebody afterwards can tell me if there's uh, incorrect statements here. Um, and then, you know, the next thing I said is, can you show me an example DAG for crawling the web and computing token stats based on this? Uh, so it gave me a description of what are the tasks or what are the libraries that I need to use and kind of what are the components of the task that need to be solved. Uh, and then it gave me some code, which, you know, from a, a newcomer perspective, I think this probably would help me. I don't know if this is, you know, better than a, a tutorial I would have found on exactly this. But, you know, it was interesting to me if you look uh, here. I think I then asked it. Sorry, did I miss a step? Yeah, so then I asked it to modify this. So now we're talking about the code editing, the make changes in response to a natural language request. Um, please make it run weekly and process a given list of URLs instead. Um, and you know, it then gives me this idea, which I think I now am developing a bit of a mental model here in terms of I can, you know, for each URL, create a separate uh, task. I don't know if this is good practice or not. So again, like, you know, let me know afterwards. Um, but yeah, so that's the kind of idea. You know, that's an example of give me kind of a natural language description of what's going on here. Uh, implement some request that I have, a kind of like a, a from scratch request, and then given that, uh, make a request to make a change in response to that and ask for an edit uh, in response. Okay, so those at least are kind of like ideas of how I might start thinking about poking around and saying, uh, hey, like how well does the model work for this 
uh, kind of use cases? What kinds of things would I, would I go about trying first to see what it's able to do? Um, and so, yeah, so I wanted to leave with a, a few thoughts here, uh, maybe sort of questions for you to think about um, or for discussion later. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind if we're thinking about like LLMs and Airflow is what's the most valuable use cases that we want from this? Um, is this is this something where you know the the interest is to help beginners and we want to make it easier for a newcomer to you know from the time they decide they want to start playing with something that they're up and running and using it? Uh, is it something where you know there are uh, pain points for seasoned veterans where this will help with some kind of repetitive things or corner cases or whatnot. You know, is it debugging? Are there gotchas? Uh, so I think kind of going through this exercise of saying uh, where, where do we think the most valuable use cases would be is kind of a good uh, starting point. Uh, the second thing I, I really want to emphasize is this idea of uh, evaluation. So it's a, it's a hard problem that comes up across the whole area these days, which is just how well does a model work for a particular case? If I were to come and say, okay, like, uh, how good is the model today at what matters for Apache Airflow use cases uh, versus how good was the model six months ago? How do we quantify that? How do you answer that? This requires uh, having an understanding of what are the use cases that matter and specific examples, and also some way of evaluating whether it was good or not. So if we just have free-form responses, that's fairly hard, I guess, to get a, a good answer to, but maybe there's ways of quantifying this and thinking about this. And I think this is, you know, if you're thinking seriously about um, using LLMs uh, across the workflow, having an evaluation where you're able to track uh, model capabilities over time in a way that you trust and rely on uh, is a super valuable thing to have. And you know, maybe some things don't work today, but they will work in a few months. Or you know, just getting an overall sense. Uh, this can be a very revealing exercise. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, I think it's it's interesting to play around with these models and get an understanding of what are their capabilities, but also what are their limitations, and then thinking about. Um, how to design around those. So, you know, maybe there's ways of, of giving automatic feedback where models make a mistake, and maybe this is enough to steer it back on course. Um, or maybe the, you know, the ability to interact with these models breaks some assumptions that you might have about what's hard and what's easy. This might open new opportunities uh, and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, so I think just kind of understand, play around, uh, and be creative would be the, the sort of the the closing thoughts here. So thank you.